Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, we have a, an absolutely phenomenal guest today. Our FM influencer today is a childhood hero of mine, Gary Hall Sr. Um, Gary, thank you so much for being with us today. John, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. This, this is an amazing experience. We got a chance to meet for the first time a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's incredible for me, so thank you. He was a flag bearer for the U.S. Olympic team, which I believe... Um, not many swimmers have ever done that. Is that correct, Gary? It's a pretty small group of two of us, um, Michael Phelps and myself. I, mean, I love being in any group with Michael Phelps. But, uh, I was the first that, uh, you're the first then. swimmer to carry the flag in the opening ceremony in 1976. And Michael was the second who was named in 2016. So, wow. yeah, great honor. And you, yeah. you and I have something very much in common, which is our coach, Doc, Doc Councilman, who is absolutely a phenomenal person. So it's funny, a, a while back, I was listening to some of your shows and, and I saw my head going up and down and agreeing with almost everything you said. And I finally, said, wait a minute, we were trained by the same person. So that would make sense. <laughs> so there's a lot yeah. of agreement on, on what we see. You have, if I'm right, you have three Olympic gold medals yourself and a son it has an, uh, an Olympic gold medal. Is that correct? Actually, I have three medals. I wish uh, they were gold, but they're not. Two of okay. them are silver and one's bronze. And my wow. son has 10 Olympic medals. He was in 10 Olympic races and walked away with 10 Olympic medals. So that was pretty cool. I swam in six different Olympic races and ended up with three. So I was three wow. for six and he was 10 for 10. Wow, that's amazing. And I can't imagine what your trophy case must look like at home. Holy cow. Incredible. Dusty, very dusty. Dusty, yeah, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have the same medals in there, though. You had told me um, earlier when we were talking that it was it was great to be there and, and actually compete, but even better to watch your son. It was. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than having a son or daughter, and it, it, not even at the Olympics, just watching them do well in competition. Uh, it's a goosebump moment for parents, and that's what we, that's what we live for as our kids. And uh, you know, I tried hard not to uh, relive my experiences for my son, so I stayed back. I didn't coach him, but and that can be a tough thing to do, right? Especially when you're as knowledgeable as you are. It, it can be. And, and, and some parents don't have any option. I mean, there's no other coach. They have to coach their kids and, and be parents too. That's a tough role to do both. I was fortunate and it was hard enough just being a dad, but um, I had great coaches that we were able to find for Gary to help him in his career. I was glad to let them coach. I'm hoping that I have the same wisdom. I, I'm an old dad, so I have an eight and a half year old and a four year old, and I hope I have the same wisdom not to coach them, but just to open doors for them. Now, you have a, a total of six children. You, you also uh, just kind of going along. So you have a whole, whole right, six, uh, three, three girls and three boys. That, that must be incredible. Now, later on, after you've done this, you had a, a career as an eye surgeon. And can you just really quick mention what you were talking about with the, the eyewear and what's so important for coaches with that? I, I was an ophthalmologist for 25 years in Phoenix. Phoenix has, Arizona has 300 days of sunshine a year. Saw a lot of UV damage to the eye. Treated a lot of it. Some of it's treatable, some of it's not. Some of it can actually lead to blindness. Mm -hmm. And there are five major eye diseases caused by UV some by blue light as well. Yeah, anyway, along that path, I, I developed uh, a, a rating system for sunglasses. Never been adopted. The sunglass industry has, has really stonewalled it. It's, it's a great system. It gives consumers a full understanding of the UV protective value of sunglasses. Right now, you don't get that, uh, unfortunately. So the industry's kept the consumers pretty much in the dark, so to speak about how much UV protection they're really getting, making them believe that they're actually getting more protection than they are. So that's a process. I mean, that's been a, a project of mine. And along the way, I, I've you know, written a couple of times to coaches. Swimming coaches are particularly high risk because especially if you're coaching in the Southern United States or anywhere where there's sun, bright sun, uh, it's not just being outside and on the deck for those many hours, 
but because we're right next to water and water reflects up to, depending on the, the time of the day, it can reflect up to 50% more UV into, into the face or into the eye. So lifeguards so can, would have an issue as well, I guess, outdoor lifeguards and... Lifeguards are at risk. Anyone who works outdoors really is at risk. Um, and particularly during the middle day hours of the day. So it's really easy to prevent the eye disease that are UV related, and that's just wearing good protective sunglasses. 100% uh, UV protection, wraparound frames, fairly tight fitting. But a lot of the damage doesn't come from above. You'd think the sun's up there and it's coming down. It actually comes from below. It bounces, reflects off the surface of the deck or the water or snow, whatever you're standing on. And that's where the danger is coming from, above, from down below. And right, then you see a lot of people getting snow blindness when they're skiing and things like that. Right, that's yeah. all bouncing off of that. But if anyone out there has any interest, you can always reach me. You can email me at GarySenior at theraceclub.com. And I'll, I'll tell you the type of sunglass lens you should be wearing and the type of style. There isn't one just one company or one brand. There's lots of good brands out there. But you want to make sure that you protect your eyes well, particularly from the sides and down below. You want to have a fairly tight-fitting frame. It almost seems like a must uh, have for a lot of people. Oh, I don't know if I can uh, afford a, a more expensive glass or something like that. You couldn't afford not to get the right one if you're in this business, right? It's one of the commercial yeah. needs. It doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, some of the most protective sunglasses are not expensive. Now you're the, the CEO for the race club at this point, right? Uh, your son started it and, and you've taken it over from there and and you're doing some amazing things. We're going to find out a little bit more about the, the race club in just a moment. But can you tell us a little bit, just Britt, take us back in when, when you were a, a kid and, and tell us what you got started, how you got started into swimming. Well, I was raised in California, in Orange County, a little town called Garden Grove. There were a lot of clubs that were coming up, popping up in Orange County at that time, one of which was founded by an Olympic diver named Sammy Lee. He was a physician. Parents were born in Korea. They brought him to the United States when he was very little. Grew up in LA. He, he started this club to help you know, train divers and to bring swimming in as well. It was the Sammy Lee Swimming and Diving School in Anaheim, California. And that's where I started. I was seven years old. My path was anything but a linear. It was very up and down. I had a great first run until I was 10. I went downhill almost quit when I was 14. And then I discovered a new coach and came back when I was 15 or 16 and ended up making the Olympic team a year later. So how important was that coach? He was everything. A lot of people know that the first coach that really got me excited about swimming again was John Urbanchek, who was- Well, a he's very, amazing, isn't he? Yeah, he's a very famous. I was, even to this day, he claims Gary L. Senior was my first you know, good swimmer that I coached when I came to the United States as a coach. Um, he was born in Hungary, went to University of Michigan, comes from grad school to California, starts coaching the Sammy Lee Swim School, and there I am. And he came to me at the right time. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to train with John more than just a year uh, because uh, he was in a different district in school and I couldn't transfer to his school. He wouldn't let me. So I had another coach that came along who was also brilliant, and his name was Flip Dar. Uh, he's no longer with us, but he's in the Hall of Fame, and he's coached, I don't know how many Olympians he coached, many, uh, Shirley Babishoff, Steve Gregg, the Furness brothers, um, you know, John Mickinen, all Olympians. John Mickinen, I, he was a roommate of mine in the really? National Sports Festival, just a, um, a real gentleman, yep. yeah. outstanding person. And Flip coached him as well. But Flip was the guy that really took me to the Olympics. And then from there, it was Doc, really, that, that took me from that point on. What, what made you go to Indiana and, and, and with Doc Councilman? There were two schools that were really dominated swimming in those days, unlike today, where there's many schools that have great swimming programs. Uh, there was a clear difference in the level of swimming uh, at the two top schools, which were Indiana University and University of Southern California. Better coaches, Peter Dalen, Doc Council, 
mm. great coaches. There were other great coaches, but they didn't coach collegiately. They coached at the club level, George Haynes, Don Gamble. So nice. we didn't have the option of going to those guys in college. Doc was very persuasive. Yeah, you meet him, you want to go and be with him. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't a it wasn't a hard sell. He just, right. he you, you you know you got to know him. He said, "Wow, this guy knows a lot, mm. and he's really interesting. He's he's smart, and he cares and, more about you than 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 your swimming, which is incredible." That's right. Yeah, it turned out to be a great decision. Had a great four years. Uh, we won the uh, national championships. All four years I was there, in case there are any Trojan fans out there, we beat USC <laughs> each, each year. How do you feel like your, your experience with swimming, when you went into, um, you know, going to, to being a doctor, how did, how did your experience in swimming impact your future career? First and foremost, I think I went into medicine because my father was a physician and my grandfather was a physician. There was, there was no pressure at all from those guys me to become a physician. But I think I felt more of a sense of security. There was no professional swimming at the time. Um, you, you couldn't make a living. And so beyond college, there really wasn't much of, of an opportunity to swim competitively. I, I don't know that I would have ever gone back and gone to medical school if I'd taken four or five or six years uh, focusing on you know professional swimming. I don't think I would have gone back and gone to medical school. Had a good run. 25 years of it. I, I felt that was enough. I just felt it was the right time. It was the right age. I was only 55 when I decided to become a swimming coach. Here I am 15 years later, almost 70, and I still feel like, yeah, I've still got some, I'm learning every day. And I'm still- It's old. funny. Yeah. I hear you say that, that 70 word, and, and I'm, I'm 58 now. And, and I think we're about somewhere around 10, 10 years apart or so. I remember seeing you on, on TV when I was 10 years old. I was watching you guys really, you know, beat everybody up in the, in the Olympics. When you get to know you, you don't seem like that age, that number, that 70, right? You just, yeah, you just seem like you're just getting started again. It's, it's fun and exciting uh, to, to, to talk with you and, and all the incredible ideas you have are just amazing. What, what does swimming generally mean to you? Since I was seven. I actually learned this when I think I was two. My dad taught me. It's always been a big part of my life in some way. Even when I was practicing medicine, I did 10 years. I was a triathlete and I managed the Phoenix Swim Club, which was a big operation in Phoenix. We had our Olympic pool. Uh, it's always been part of my life. And my son, all of my six kids swam. Uh, my wife was a swimmer. Her brother was an Olympian. Her dad was an NC2A swimming champion. It's like chlorine is in the hall blood and, and bloodline. And I still swim. In fact, when we're done with this, I'm going over and I'm going to be swimming. So I, and I, I missed the week because I was uh, busy coaching last week. To me, it's a, it's a form of relaxation and, and good exercise. And you can do it for life. There are many sports that have a hundred and up age group. You know, swimming is one of those sports and it says a lot about it says a lot about the people that are in it that still want to race at that age. Yeah. Once they're in that community, and this is what's a, such a big deal. It's not about just who was the fastest person ever. Every community member is valuable to us. And, and right. And we appreciate their contributions. Sometimes they're not the fastest swimmer out there, but that's not what it's about. No, not at all. It's, I mean, they're very competitive people in, in the masters. Don't get me wrong, but it's a, it's, it's a social event and people love to go and interact with others. And they're all passionate about the sport. It's, it's not about winning or losing here. It's about having fun, getting healthy and just enjoying life. What we've done here um, is we have what's called the, the cornerstones of athletic performance. We built this originally from, you know, some of the information that I learned from Doc Councilman. One of the things that, that we learned is that fuels like sleep, hydration, nutrition, and oxygen, almost like consumables. Mm -hmm. And they would flow through one of the three energy systems, which would create, you know, either endurance or speed or explosivity. And from there, it would go over. So those fuels would run through there and then over to strength and flexibility. That's the muscular system. that's going to contract using that energy. It's going to contract around the skeletal system, which is technique, how you move your bones. 
And then the bones get you to where you want to go. And the whole question is, which is the brain, right? The whole question is, do you know where you want to go and how to get there? And then synergy would be like racing, how you put it all together, right? How you bring those things together. In your opinion, with all your background here, what do you see as one of the most significant areas? I, I wrote a book this summer during COVID. And in that book, in one of the first chapters, I talk about the science. I really describe the four basic sciences that intersect in the sport of swimming. And, and those that was in your FINA presentation too, wasn't it? it? It was in the FINA presentation. That was excellent. Well. Got it. And those four basic science really are, are the same ones, that cover the same ones that you here have here on your slide. And what are those? Well, the physiology, which is really your energy systems, right. um, as well as strength, flexibility, and in, injury management, uh, which is also part kinesiology, or the body movements, and technique can be lumped into that as well. Then you have physics, which is also part of technique. Uh, fuels really goes along with physiology and developing the right nutritional elements that are gonna help you perform at the highest level. And the fourth uh, basic science that intersects in the sport of swimming is the, is the, the neurological sciences or the, the, what controls the, the, the neuromuscular response. The, the brain controlling the body, and the movements of the body, which is to me one of the real, uh, I think, uh, frontiers of, of our sport. We haven't really learned as much about how our brains can control our bodies. I noticed that particular thing that we have so much crossover here on how we perceive that swimming and, and, and the different aspects of it. What would you say one of the more challenging areas for you uh, were, I mean, here you are, uh, you know, won three, uh, Olympic medals, what was one of the challenging areas for you? For me, it was probably the inequity of when children and they're going through the sport mature physically. In other words, when they go through puberty, they're going to get stronger, the hormonal changes, and, and there's a lot of improvement that comes along with that strength. Without the right technique or training, that is very short-lived, but I was a very late late bloomer and very small. When I started my sophomore year in high school, I weighed 115 pounds. You were so slender. I remember the pictures. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was a runt. I was a small guy. Uh, and I got beat a lot by got, and people that I used to be when we were 10 or 11. I could, I could beat them. We were more evenly sized. And they got big and they could beat me. It was very discouraging. So for me to understand that at that age was hard. You're not going to enjoy every moment of the sport, but overall, you've got to really, you got to have fun. you got to have fun. If you don't have fun doing this, then it's not going to be something you should do because life is way too short. And I'm not saying you have fun every single day. It's hard. It's a very, very difficult sport. That doesn't mean it's not fun. It could be fun and hard too. I always tell every swimmer, John, that at the end of their career, I'm not going to judge them by how many Olympic medals they won, how many world records they set, or even national or, or state or local records. It's not about that. It's about how well did you perform in your championship meet every season or every chapter I call season chapter of your life. There's a championship meet where you set a goal to swim at a certain speed. And how often in your career did you make those goals happen and if you make those goals happen regardless of what level you end up reaching it doesn't matter you're a champion when you do succeed or when you do set goals and you make those goals guess what you have fun you enjoy it you feel that achievement right that you're you're actually yeah. progressing and and moving forward that's Watch. right <laughs> when you're a swimmer and how successful you got and the fact that you it wasn't success immediately Right? There was ups and downs, and then you got there. And then you went to your next career, right? being an ophthalmologist. And again, right up and go. And now in, in what you're doing now. So these three major phases that, I, that you've explained so far is you know, continuous success of getting somewhere and, and, and digging in. And that's a great thing because a lot of people, they, they, they stop when they don't have success. And that's yeah. not the way to go. I think you want to have success, but you have to, you have to dig too. You have to dig and you can't be afraid, especially as you're transitioning from being just a, a 
uh, focusing on being a swimmer to something else. You got to take a leap of faith. You don't know if you're going to be good in that. You got to say, okay, I'm going to try. You know, I may not be as good doing whatever I designed to do as a, you know, my career as I was as a swimmer, but I'm going to find out if I can be anywhere close or maybe better. But you have to be willing to take that leap of faith. And a lot of people aren't. They want to clutch onto something they're pretty good at and they don't want to let go. You're not going to be able to retire on what you earn in sports swimming. You're going to have to do something else. What is that something else? And, and from that swimming career, you can learn the systems that can make you succeed and then you apply them to another, right? And that's exactly right. Yeah. So if you're just in to try to you know, make a giant living, that's not what it's going to be about. And, and But as you go along, you can find incredible ways that that, that has helped you to gain success. So I want to talk right now about um, our companies right there. We, we're in the, you know, the same swimming community. We're helping and supporting. I want to show a little difference on how the two of us differ in the way we work, because I think they're both very valuable. Um, but a lot of times people don't understand the differences. They're just a swimming company. No, we're, we're very different. So I'm going to share again my screen here. There's four levels the way we look at it. And the first level is the scientists right, that are researching um, new aspects, finding out things that we don't already know and, and contributing to that, that data and that information base. Next step is we have these where, we, where we're interpreting the research, presenting it in usable ideas, and, and we're helping you know, take that research and, and, and that science and delivering it to the community. Now, we both started pretty much the same way with the same source of information, which is why we have a lot of agreements on what things, you know, should happen because it came from councilman originally. He had a, I know he put out a book um, and that, that book, he, a number of books, but one of them was converted to, I think, 57 languages distributed worldwide. So the, the basis of science for swimming really kind of started there, if I'm correct. And then from there, though, we, we had to define our company as an educational company. We're not a research company. And, and so what we do is we take that research and we, we build avatars so you can see it in different ways and present it so that people can understand it and use it. Then you have coaches that are applying it in the workout on the deck to the swimmers and getting it into the, into the water with those swimmers. And so what we do is we build tools for presentation and things like that so we can get it down into that group. Now, what you guys do the step one and you also do step two where you're doing the actual scientific research and you actually work with the swimmers as well you actually do and, and you have such a unique aspect of looking at the research that i'd love to have people understand what's different between your research and other researchers how do you do that well i think starting from doc as you said who highly influenced both of us um very inquisitive as I am, and even as when I was in pre-med, I was a physics major in Indiana University for two years before switching over to go into medicine. But the physics uh, one, I was always intrigued by it. And, and two, um, you know, it, it was kind of like problem solving. And the way I look at a swimmer is it, here's a problem, you know, how do you solve it? How, how do you solve the problem to make the swimmer faster. And there's kind of two aspects of, of a swimmer's success. One is in the training, uh, the development of the energy systems, the physiology and the anatomy. And there's the other is the technique. And, and today, most coaches are really focused on the training. And there's been very small amount of energy focused on the technique. And yet, one can make a pretty good argument that swimming is the most technique sensitive sport in the world, more than, I mean, technique is important in every sport, golf, tennis, you know, the, the high jump, the long jump, running, cycling, technique matters in all those sports. With sure poor that. technique, you're not gonna do well. And why is it more important than swimming? Well, because we're in water with, with, a, with a density of 800 times with air, when we make a, a, a mistake in the pool, in the water, we pay a bigger price. We pay a much bigger price than we do in air. And, and the forces of drag, which I call the number one enemy of the swimmer, are very compelling in this medium that we're in. 
not every sport's in that medium, okay? Some are like sailing, you know, uh, water sports. They have to contend with the drag too, but they're, and that's what the sport of sailing is largely about. How do I get the drag down so my boat will go faster? Well, we have the same issues, in fact, even more so, even though we're traveling at lower speeds, we don't have to go very fast. So I our body is really the vehicle, right? The body is the vehicle. We don't have any other, anything else to help us. You know, it's, it's our hands and our feet providing the propulsion and then how we shape our body to reduce drag in all of our motions, which are continually changing, to determine how fast we are. Um, there's three you know, Newtonian laws that really determine how good a swimmer gets. And those are laws defined in the 1600s by Sir Isaac Newton. You know, what is the force of propulsion? What is the force of drag? And how well do we take advantage of the law of inertia? Those three are it. I mean, there's a lot of other laws that can be applied to swimming. Those three are basically what determines a good or not so good swimmer. They're the so, primary factors, that's right. Hmm. They're, the, they're the primary factors. And so um, fluid mechanics, which is a study of you know, flows in water and so forth are a derivative of Newtonian mechanics. So they're really talking about the same thing with some, you know, various difference because of it, the flow of the water can affect, which it does affects the swimmer. We decided, I decided if I'm going to do the sport that I want to be involved on the technique side for a couple of reasons. Number one is I feel as if, and I still do this, I still feel this way. We live in the dark ages of swimming in terms of technology. Thank you. I feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. What is available out there in the world that's been applied in other sciences and other fields and other sports, we are living in the dark ages. We are not taking advantage of technology that's out there. And, and I have the three-pronged test. When it comes to science and using research or technology, you have to pass all three parts of the test. Or as far as I'm concerned, the research is useless. Number one is, do you trust the technology? Do you trust that it's accurate? And whatever you're doing to do the testing, is it giving you the right information? Not always the case. And, and when you read other researchers and what they're doing, they may or may not be doing it correctly. You don't know because you weren't there to see them do it. You don't know exactly you know, what's accurate, what's not accurate. So you have to trust them a little bit. And I don't like doing that. In this case, I'm a little bit more hands-on. I like to do things myself to know they were done correctly and that I can trust the data command is real. The second is, okay, now we get the data. Are we analyzing it correctly? I remember, and as a physician, I, had, I knew cardiologists who could take an EKG of your heart and diagnose problems that I could never see on the EKG. They could read your EKG way better than I ever could because they had years of experience analyzing these electrical patterns and knew exactly what they meant. And they they some of them have that insight, right? And some of them, even though they've been there years, still don't have the insight, right? Some have a knack for it and, and some don't. And you have to have an analytical mind. You have to be able to dig. Okay, here's data. Okay, that's fine. Here's a test. Great, what are you gonna do with that? And extracting that information, the right information and interpreting correctly is not that easy. It has to be done correctly. Otherwise you can come to the wrong conclusion given all the right data, you can make a totally wrong assumption and come up and recommend a swimmer does something completely wrong just based on analyzing something incorrectly. So that's the second prong. The third prong is okay, you got good testing, good research. The information coming out is accurate. You think you're interpreting it correctly. Now you have to change something in the swimmer. Can the swimmer learn to do that? In other words, can they apply what you're teaching them? And that's a tough question too, because not every swimmer can. Some do it better than others. And it's not a black and white sport. So it's not like everything's gonna work the same way in every swimmer, right. because there's so many variables. So it's not, it's not a simple three-prong test, but in the end, I, I do the research because 
I want to trust the information and I can trust myself better than anybody else. Two, I know the technology I'm dealing with mm -hmm. and, and I select it out. I'm not just, you know, randomly trying something. And third, second, I feel after years and it doesn't happen overnight that I'm able to analyze the results better and have a better handle. And I, I still keep improving. And we have four different technologies we use. We use a velocity meter where we're measuring velocity, acceleration, deceleration at, at every 0.02 seconds synchronized to video. And I have learned more about the sport swimming through that technology than anything else, including Don. That has just made me understand a lot more about what makes swimmers swim fast or not. And then we have a pressure meter where I measure the the power or the pressure of the hand, not the force, but the pressure, which is related to the force. Mm -hmm. And we and we synchronize that. And we also measure the body rotational speeds. Very important, what I call coupling motion, kinetic energy that's used to increase power. And, and we've been able to look at that. And it's taken me a couple of years to figure that out, to understand what's good, what's not good. These are new metrics, John. We're not, we're looking at new, parameters that always looked at before. So we have to figure out what's normal, what's good, what's bad, and, and where does you know this 10-year-old or 12-year-old, 16-year-old fit in compared to others. So it's all been uh, and continues to be a work in progress. You're able to have this very clear view of, I want to get this to plug this into this puzzle. And as you find these pieces, I think you're your insight is so valuable uh, playing a part in this versus a lot of times just a researcher that's out there trying to, you know, get something to research because that's what they need to do. In your case, you're just plugging pieces in and, and, and you can see the results. You know, it's amazing what you guys can do with swimmers. Thank you. And, and I, I don't have an interest in publishing. A lot of people in the academic world, that they live for that, you know, publishing, you know, builds their fame and reputation, ego, whatever. I'm not, I checked my ego at the door. If I want to figure out if, if, if a certain hand position is causing more drag, I go to Florida, I test it, I do it a several times. I do it where we do 200 tests in 10 seconds. So I'm not just checking it once or twice, but I have a statistically significant number of tests that make me confident that the data is accurate. But I don't want to wait three months to have somebody approve it, some peer review committee, prove a paper that gets published next year. If I get the information you out today- You may not even know anywhere near as much as you do. <laughs> yeah, and if I get the information out today, I'm going to write about it tomorrow. It's going to right. be in our in our Aquanote or, you know, soon. Uh, I haven't written about everything we did in our last study back in February. I was down in the Keys and we did a bunch of drag studies. And I haven't written about every single one of them, but most of them I've put out already. And if people want to know what have you studied lately and what are you doing, all they have to do is go on our website and get to the documents and they'll read about it or, or go on our news feed and say, Dr. Hall, what do you, you know, what do you think of this hand position? I, know I what, measured what, that. What is that, what is that web page? Is it theraceclub.com? It's theraceclub.com. And, and if you go there and you go on news feed, and you have to be a lane one member, but it, it's free. So all you have to do is put your email address in there. And then you can read all the comments in the news feed. You can get all the aqua notes in there. The aqua notes, almost all of them are free. And there's, I think there's 300 articles I've written. You, yeah. you also did, um, and, and I mentioned this before, you did two shows on, on FINA, if I'm right, so far. Um, and, and if you want to see more about uh you know what some of the presentations your your son i believe did the video work which was absolutely beautiful and then did some animations on there um if you go to learning.fina.org you can see those presentations you made then you can come over and and how would they if, if somebody wanted to work with you 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 have two locations is that right we have two locations one in isla Mirada, florida in the keys uh, which was our original location. And I'm now in Coronado, uh, which is right outside of San Diego. Right. Uh, it's right over the bridge. I'm looking at downtown San Diego. So here- you're Beautiful 15, view there. <laughs> it's a beautiful view. 
15 minutes from the airport to, to the pool, which has six blocks. I ride my bike to the pool here. And then in, Corona, in the Isla Mirada, it's a bit of a trip. You get to Miami, you got to drive. It's a beautiful drive in the Keys, a great place to go. It's about an hour and a half to go from the airport down to the Keys. Uh, but either location, Coach Devin Murphy is in the Florida all the time. I'm here. And we do three things. We, do, we either do private instruction, camps, which we are about 10 a year in each location. Um, some of them are, are specific, like we have one camp that is focused on just starts and turns in each location or two. The rest of them are four day camps. Those are, that one's a two day camp. And then the rest of the time, it's either private instruction or online coaching. And the online coaching is relatively new. We started that about two years ago. And Devin and I have clients all over the world that we coach online. We do two 30 minute video sessions a month. And in those, we review videos of their races or their technique and training or in the backyard pool, or we talk about goals or we set workout schedules for them. We try to shore up any weaknesses we can. Some of them I've never actually ever seen, you know, in person. Mm -hmm. you know, I have two or three clients in Asia, Australia, or New Zealand that I've never actually coached on deck with. Now, now Gary, when, when you do those camps and, and Devin does those camps and Devin's outstanding as well, right? Otherwise I'm guessing he wouldn't be working with you. So um, let me ask you a question. Are you guys on, on the deck with the swimmers and working with those swimmers? Yeah, we are. And they're, and they're technique focused camps. They're not training camps. We do have one training camp that we offer a year uh, in each location, but the majority of our camps, and even those, we can help ourselves. We're, we're correcting technique all the time. Uh, and then in addition, when you come for either of those camps or privates, we offer those three or four different tests in addition that if you want to take a deeper dive, if you really want to know more about what you're doing right or wrong, then there's, there's just a limit you can see from the deck. And we think we're pretty good. That's what you do. That's what I do. We, we, we have a good eye. We're observers. But I'm telling you, John, as long as I've done it, you've done it longer than I have, you, you can't see. Things happen really quickly. When you start to see the level of detail that you pick out of these tests and go, oh my gosh, I didn't see that or I didn't realize they were doing that. It's pretty incredible what we can get out of those tests. So we offer those tests, you know, additionally, when, they, when you come here, if you want them, you don't have to have them, but they're there for anybody who wants. Yeah, you can see a lot underwater. You can see, we're actually, um, the, the next uh, FINA presentation that, that I'm doing, I've got a couple more coming up. One, um, the first one is on this, the feel for the water which um, we're going to be helping to define clearly so everybody can understand what the feel really means and how it how it functions. And then uh, the next one after that is going to be on on the brain and harnessing emotion. And, and we're going to be looking at these two different aspects and we have it all animated and, and things like this. But I think um, the ability that, that, that you have to dig in and what we call slippage right in the water where, where somebody like kind of pulls their hand this way you could see that type of thing even though technique all looks like it's connecting and things like that and you've got all the boxes checked but then all of a sudden if you look at somebody might be slipping then immediately from underwater you can see that type of thing right you can not only see it with underwater but if you do the velocity you can quantitate the mistake you can see how much the velocity dropped or the deceleration occurred as a result of losing their grip or hold on the water. Uh, with a pressure meter, you can actually measure the force and you can see when the force diminishes when their hand slips in or slips up, they lose their hold on that water. Uh, now we measure it. We don't just look at it and say, oh, it looks like you're slipping. We know how much you slipped and how much it cost you. In terms Got it. Of and you can see the, the, the loss of return, mm -hmm. right, when, when you do slip. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. And it, it's not just the amateur swimmers that are a problem. We, we videoed Olympians and tested Olympians and see them making mistakes as well. So every swimmer at every level is making mistakes. 
Yeah, and right, exactly. So there, nobody's perfect, and everybody, right? We were taught that you can always be better. You'll never be perfect. Keep digging in. I'm learning even a lot more on this show about what you guys do, and 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 it's fantastic. I want to thank you for joining us, Gary. And hopefully, uh, at some point in the, in the near future, we can do it again to to really look at some of the more aspects that that you're digging into. Well, thank you, John. I love what I do. I know you do too. Uh, and that's one of the great things in life. If you can find something you love, you're passionate about, and still make a living doing it, yep. that's a pretty cool thing. You put a lot in, you got a lot back, and now you're still giving back. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, John. Appreciate All it. Right. Keep up Take the care. Work. Thank you. You too.